Good evening and welcome to our program. Uh, I'm Gavin Cleesby, is the Director of Programs, Exhibitions and Community Partnerships for the Massachusetts Historical Society. For anyone who may be new to MHS, we are the first historical society in America, dating back to 1791. Uh, we are an independent nonprofit organization that maintains a research library that provides access to a remarkable collection of manuscripts, including the papers of three US presidents, as well as soldiers, mothers, poets, and protesters. We host a wide variety of programs for both the public and academic audiences on topics related to Massachusetts and American history. We make many of our resources available to the public for free, including our rotating, rotating exhibitions. I hope you'll join us for future programs or visit MHS. We are honored to be partnering with the Northeastern University School of Law Criminal Justice Task Force for a second year, extending our series on confronting racial injustice. I wanna particularly acknowledge the work of Professor Margaret Wu, who has been the central planner for this program uh, and this series. Uh, we also appreciate all of our partner institutions who have helped us reach such a broad audience. So please join me in welcoming Professor Margaret Wu. Thank you so much, Gavin. Um, I'm Margaret Wu, Professor of Law at Northeastern University School of Law. And again, I want to thank the Mass Historical Society for hosting this event along with Northeastern. So Confronting Racial Injustice is a series looking at the experience of racial minorities in Massachusetts. And Asian Americans are definitely a part of that history. So I myself came here in 1964 after my own grandfather who came to Massachusetts in the 20s, following his father who came in the late 1800s. So Asian American has had a long history in Massachusetts and we will hear a little bit about that today. So we begin the event with a short video from Mayor Michelle Wu herself of Taiwanese descent. And then I will turn it over to our moderator, Judge Catherine Hom of the Massachusetts Superior Court. Hi everyone, it's Mayor Michelle Wu and I am so honored to join the Massachusetts Historical Society and Northeastern for today's event. It is in some ways a shock and a surprise still that I get to serve in this role now six months in to being the mayor of a city that has given my family and me everything that we cherish. Last week, I had the chance to join the president and vice president and leaders from across the AAPI community at the White House for this administration's very first AANHPI in-person celebration because so many years of the pandemic have been over Zoom. And I remember standing there in the Rose Garden seeing Vice President Kamala Harris speaking from the podium with the official United States seal right on it and thinking my parents when they came to this country 40 years ago never would have been able to imagine that site. Our first Asian American and black woman vice president surrounded by and in a space with API leaders from across the country, fellow mayors, Congress people, community leaders, activists. It was truly remarkable to have that experience and to reflect on, in some ways, how striking of a journey this has been for me and my family. Growing up, I was the oldest daughter to immigrant parents. My mom and dad had come from Taiwan to the United States shortly before I was born in the mid-1980s, and they had nothing in their pockets, didn't speak English. My dad was a scientist. My mom worked at first at the Chinatown Library and then became a, a homemaker and stayed at home as she became a mom and, and uh, my three siblings and I were born. I remember my mom learned English primarily by watching Oprah and so we had lots of good advice growing up. Uh, I would get the Mandarin version of whatever Oprah had said earlier that day. And the instructions were clear in an immigrant family to especially the oldest daughter, my job was to work hard and keep my head down. The intention was I would maybe be a doctor or a lawyer if I could make it, an engineer, a scientist, um, at least make some money, stay out of trouble, and then raise my own family and hope that I could create even more opportunity for them. Never in a million years would my family or I or any of my friends all the way up through college 
have imagined that I would be the one to end up in politics. I'm naturally quite introverted and I never ever had this on my list. As a young girl, there weren't very many Asian American women on TV in the mainstream media. Michelle Kwan was probably the most famous person and so I would have adults saying to me all the time when I was little, hey, do you want to become a figure skater when you grow up? And people encouraging me to somehow dream to be an Olympic figure skater, never once mentioning government or politics or anything. And that shows the power of representation, not only in the young people who could see themselves reflected or represented, but in the adults around them and what pathways we are holding open to the young people that we're nurturing. So this has really in some ways been one unexpected uh, situation after another led me to this point. As I was graduating from college, my mom was diagnosed with very serious mental illness and I stepped into the role of being her caregiver and raising my two sisters. All of a sudden, the very carefully constructed bubble that my family had had protecting us from politics and government so we could just keep our heads down and work hard, that burst when I needed to become legal guardian for my sisters and learn how to navigate a very complex bureaucracy in the public schools or in opening a small family business and having to jump through all the hoops just to do something to keep us going and, and to help our community thrive and prosper or in some ways especially navigating what felt like at times a very broken system when it comes to healthcare, particularly mental health care. Some of the moments that I carry deeply with me now when I think about why I'm in this work and what motivates me to keep going and to keep fighting are those moments with my mom when I saw just how much our systems aren't designed for people who look like my family or might speak another language. And that the resources might be there, the healthcare might exist, the providers might be there, but then if the systems end up being dehumanizing and perpetuating injustices or discrimination or fear, then in fact, you feel like that stigma only grew. And so time after time, whenever my family has gone through challenges, I try to fight through, but then also understand how we could make a larger change. It took me a long time to be able to talk to anyone, even my closest friends, about my mom's mental illness. And that sense of shame and stigma was very deep culturally and in the, in the ways that my family had grown up and, and were raised. That stigma, I now know, is very much a barrier to how residents of color, multilingual families, and residents across our city access the services we work so hard to provide and support and fund. And so for me, the work that we do every day of making Boston a city for everyone is about opening up the doors to ensure that no family will feel unseen or unheard in this incredible city that we have. Today, I am six months into this new role. We're building a team, a cabinet that reflects our city like never before. We're building the programming and the policies that can connect to bold, urgent change that our residents need. But we're also fighting every day to model a politics that is more inclusive and empowering because we see a breakdown nationally that has been connected to the rise of anti-Asian hate, racism, anti-Semitism, xenophobia. It's a tough moment in our democracy right now. And the national level where rhetoric around hatred and division has really taken root, that's impacted the day-to-day -day safety of our communities, as well as the conversations that we have with our neighbors right in our own neighborhoods and in our cities. And so in Boston, our goal is to create the spaces where we can build back that trust, to earn back the collaboration and partnership with residents, 
to do big things, like deliver a Boston Green New Deal, deliver the school system our kids deserve, deliver housing that is affordable for all of our residents, a transportation system that is reliable, jobs that reflect the new economy. But we know we have to do that, in some ways, pothole by pothole, streetlight by streetlight, because what's special about the city government is that we can't just exist in the realm of words and votes and positions. We are where the rubber meets the road and where residents get a feeling of whether they can depend on government when they reach out for help. And so we do big things by getting the small things right. We work hard to get City Hall out of City Hall into our neighborhoods and we're working and innovating every day to embrace the possibility for our city and for what we can do right now in this moment in city government. I'm so grateful for this opportunity to serve, to be part of a new generation of leaders connected to our communities, pushing the doors wide open. There are many firsts that I've been excited to celebrate here in Boston and with this generation across the country bringing in leadership that is looking to move faster and deliver more and act more boldly. We need to do this in coalition, in partnership, and most of all, lifting up the voices of the residents in our neighborhoods. So thank you so much. Have a wonderful event, and I am honored to be part of this. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Katherine Hamm. I'm one of the Associate Justices in the Superior Court of Massachusetts, along with Professor Wu, uh, Judges Gloria Tan, Jack Liu, and Myung Jun. We would like to welcome you all. Um, and I would like to introduce, and it is my distinct honor and privilege to introduce our three panelists and to facilitate a great discussion coming ahead. Uh, first, we have retired attorney Paul Lee, who has been an attorney since 1976, and when he joined Goodwin Proctor in 1980, he was one of the first partners in a major law firm in Boston. He is currently a founder and chair of the Asian Community Fund at the Boston Foundation, also a founder and president of Asian Community Development Corporation, uh, providing affordable housing for Asian American communities. Second, we have Professor Phil Tajitsu Nash. He is a professor of Asian American studies at University of Maryland. He is currently the co-president of Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. And lastly, but certainly not least, uh, Representative Trum Nguyen who was elected into the office as a state representative for the 18th Essex District in 2018. She is the first Vietnamese American woman elected in the office in Massachusetts. She is the first Vietnamese American elected to Massachusetts House Representative. Prior to her office, uh, she worked as a lawyer in the Greater Boston Legal Services. Welcome everyone. Uh, to get started with our discussion, I want to ask all of you um, just to introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourselves with these two questions in mind. First, who is one person who has influenced you? And second, how has your Asian identity uh, defined what you and how you do your work? So let's start with Attorney Lee. Paul. Um, thank you, uh, Judge Hom. Uh, Yep, so I, uh, in the early part of my career, everywhere I went, uh, I was really one of the few people, few Asians, few people of color. And so I noticed that difference. And I also noticed pretty quickly that I had to work harder, maybe twice as hard and achieve twice as much to be noticed. Um, so that, that was something that I always carried with me. But also, because I was different, um, I think that it made me more sensitive to recognizing differences and seeing differences in other people. And for example, in problem solving, I'm much more uh, comfortable with non-traditional approaches than the cookie cutter things that you see from the mainstream folks that I, I worked with. So that, that, so in a way, 
being Asian was a disadvantage and an advantage. And the person who influenced me the most was a young partner at Goodwin Proctor, African-American partner named Richard Soden. At the time I joined the firm, there were 100 lawyers. We were the only two lawyers of color at that time. And he adopted me. He came to my office every day to have coffee with me to make sure that uh, you know, I, I was feeling comfortable, that I wasn't about to go do something crazy. And so uh, he, he really helped me steady myself. And he also gave me a lot of advice on how to, how to deal with uh, the folks at the firm. Uh, he's really the reason for my success at the firm. Thank you. Representative Nguyen. First of all, thank you so much um, for the introduction, but also for uh, inviting me to be a part of this distinguished panel. Um, it's truly exciting to be here and I'm excited to learn from you all. Um, in terms of a uh, background about me, I came to the United States when I was five years old with my family as political refugees from Vietnam. My dad had served alongside US soldiers. And so when Vietnam fell to communism, he was forced into the re-education camps for eight years as a prisoner of war. And so in the early 90s, we immigrated uh, here to the United States, the Merrimack Valley. And they had, we basically had nothing uh, other than the clothes on our backs. And as immigrants, my parents had to work two to three jobs while taking classes to learn English. And my mother and father had to work long hours at odd jobs that had very little benefits and job security, but they did everything that they could to give me and my two sisters the opportunities that they never had. And of course, like most Asian families, uh, we believe in taking full advantage of uh, education offered to us here in the U.S. And so although I didn't know any English when I first started here in the first grade, I was able to learn uh, as an English language learner in the public school system. And I worked hard to eventually graduate at the top of my class, then attend uh, Tufts for my undergrad and became the first person in my family to graduate from college. And of course, I went on to Northeastern. Uh, uh, it's great to be here with my alma mater today. But watching my parents work so hard growing up and seeing the struggles of immigrant families like mine and working families overall, that led me to this path um, and to a career in public service as a legal services attorney, where I provided free legal representation to vulnerable populations. I represented immigrants, survivors of domestic violence, seniors, veterans, people with disabilities and low-wage workers. And as an attorney there, I saw how good policy helped people and how a lack of policy hurt them. So I advocated for policies at the state um, uh, capital, helping to secure a passage of legislation that you might have heard about, like paid family medical leave, or helping um, to secure bilingual education, uh, or to increase earned income tax credit. And from this experience, I saw how passing legislation at the state house could help so many families and how the right people in office can make such a huge difference, right? And frankly, when people ask, I, I didn't want to run, but I ran for this seat because the person who was in the seat prior to me wanted police officers to stop anyone who looks illegal, basically wanted to uh, legalized racial profiling. I could not let someone like that represent me. And that was what led me down to this path and has really influenced um, the, the types of policy work that I've been working on. But in terms of influences in my life, I have to say my parents have been the biggest influence for me. I have so much respect for and for them and others like them who leave everything behind to start a new life, to come to a place where they don't know the language, don't know the culture, and gave it all that they had. And that is what continues to drive me every single day. They taught me how to work hard and to seize opportunities that come uh, my way. And that's why I'm committed to creating opportunities for others and making sure that we're not leaving any voices out. Um, and this is exactly why it is such an honor for me to be in a panel like this when I see people looking like me doing amazing things and I hope that we continue to inspire our communities to, to continue to do that. Thank you. Professor Nash. Thank you. Uh, first of all, let me say it's, it's a great honor to be here. Uh, I've respected Northeastern Law School for so many years, having taught in another public interest law school and of course Professor Wu is doing such great work and 
as a 13th generation Massachusetts person, although I'm currently living in the land of Piscataway, also known as Washington, D.C., uh, I am descended from the Mayflower, uh, going back 13 generations on my dad's side. Of course, when I was eight years old, I was in a class in New Jersey and teacher said, who here is descended from the Mayflower? And I raised my hand and everybody said, no, you're not, because they looked at my eyes and they, how could this guy? Because I am also a third generation Japanese American. So I think being multiracial has made me very aware of intersections, made me much more inclusive, made me always try to find ways to bring people in. Some people are trying to draw lines to keep people out. I draw circles, try to bring them in. And that's really been the way my life has progressed. As far as person who had the biggest impact, I would have to say my Japanese American grandmother, uh, Ritsu Tajitsu, uh, when I was a college student, uh, she invited me over to her apartment for dinner and she left a picture on the coffee table and it was a picture of her and my family in the Japanese American internment camps during World War II. And of course, being a uh, dutiful grandson, I didn't say anything because being a immigrant grandma, she wouldn't have answered. She just wanted me to get that message by looking at that picture. So I went home and talked to my mom, found out about the camps, got very involved in the redress movement. And the only thanks I ever got from my grandmother years later, we were watching TV just before she died. And we heard about uh, Japanese Americans making progress with their redress. And she reached under the table and squeezed my hand. And that was the big thank you from grandma. So uh, she launched me into the Japanese American redress movement and uh, encouraged me to go to law school. And uh, that's it. 40 years later, here I am. Thank you, Professor Nash. Uh, Professor Nash, I'm just going to draw it to you. Um, we have the benefit of your knowledge. And if you could give us the cliff note version and a brief history of um, history of violence and discrimination against Asian American communities in our country and why we should care about that history. Uh well, I tell my students, even in a 15-week semester, you have to leave the situation and continuing to learn. There's no way we could cover it all in five minutes, 10 minutes, five hours. But broadly speaking, Asian Americans have a history that is just like a lot of other groups. We've had successes, we've had barriers, and struggles to overcome those barriers. And as I look at it, most of what we do in these type of presentations is look at the ice skaters that you mentioned, <laughs> look at the uh, Nobel Prize winning physics people. There, there's so many Asian Americans who have achieved, uh, even people like Representative uh, Wynn's parents, they are heroes to me. These are people who've struggled hard to, to overcome. But there have been significant barriers throughout our history. And that's where, when you look at the Los Angeles massacre that included, that happened in 1871, you look at the way that the Sikh Americans were chased out of Everett and Bellingham, Washington in 1903 and 1907. You look at the way that Japanese Americans were put in camps in 1941, 42, and kept there for five years. Uh, you look at the way the Filipino Americans were targeted in Watsonville, California in 1930. I could go on and on and talk about these dates, but you know, just like with an exam, you memorize the dates, you spit them out, you get your exam uh, grade and, and you forget about them. But rather than that, I'm gonna ask you to think about this framework, successes, barriers, and the barriers have been laws, they have been uh, cases, statutes, individual actions, mob violence, all sorts of things on the national, state, and local levels right here in Boston and here in Massachusetts have been some horrific things. I know my co-panels are gonna talk about some of those, but the key thing for all of us is to remember that history is a verb. It's not a noun. We consciously move that Overton window of public policy possibilities. And a hundred years ago, if somebody had said, a woman is gonna be mayor of Boston. A woman is going to be one heartbeat away from being president. They would have been laughed out of the room. Women didn't have political power. And we're going to talk about that more today. But the point is, someone moved that window of possibility. Just the same way um, 
we've seen advantages for women. We as Asian Americans have seen a lot of those advantages. And again, we'll talk about that. Just one case is worth talking about. It's called Yik Wo versus Hopkins. It's not a violence case. It, it's a uh, discrimination case, but it looks at how laundry workers in San Francisco in the 1800s wanted to get a laundry. They couldn't because they had wooden laundries and the statute said you must have a stone laundry which made sense because San Francisco is a peninsula with a lot of wind. But they started seeing that white proprietors could get a license if they had a wooden structure. And they said, this is not fair. Lawyers call this equal protection. They took the cases to the Supreme Court of the United States. And today they vindicated the rights, not just of 1800, uh, of, of Chinese American laundry owners from the 1800s, but of every person, every case that talks about equal protection, whether you are an LGBT person, an immigrant, older person, woman, almost all of them have a brief mention of the Yik Wo versus Hopkins case. So again, we've had barriers, we've had successes, and we have worked to overcome those barriers individually and as communities, and that is the history of Asian Americans. And I hope that you will go on and read more on your own and listen to my co-panelists as we talk about some of these things here in Massachusetts. Thank you, Professor Nash. Um, Representative Wynn, we've talked about and we have panelists representing uh, voices of power in government, education, and law. Uh, we've talked about Michelle Kwan in, any, in every aspect. Why does representation matter? Great question. And we need to continue to talk about this. Uh, when I was first elected, I was the first Vietnamese American woman uh, in the state house. And at the time, there were only two of us. Uh, I came in with Representative Robinson, who uh, is the first Korean American to ever get elected. And so for me, it's represent representation is not simply a buzzword or the most recent trend in politics that people tend to tweet about, right? It matters because it provides communities with leaders who understand their communities and who face similar challenges as community members. And it matters because children and adults from our communities deserve to see leaders who look like them. And frankly, government works best when every single voice is represented, when people from different backgrounds can contribute to innovative solutions and so that we can have more robust discussions about what could government be and how could government better serve the people. And representation matters because we need to see it to be it, right? Two months ago, I was uh, reading a story to children at a local elementary school here in Andover. After the story, there were two girls hung back and they looked like they wanted to talk to me. So I came over and introduced myself. They were Asian American and one of them was actually Vietnamese American. And she was just looking at me in awe. She had never seen anyone who looks like her in elected office before. And just last week, I spoke at Asia Night in, um, that was hosted by the Asian Student Association in North Andover, and they newly formed. Uh, and they this was their inaugural event, and they invited me to speak. And all of these young Asian American girls were literally lining up to take pictures with me. I've never felt like such a celebrity, but to them, it was just so wonderful for, and to see someone who looks like them. And this one uh, young student, her, she has the same name as me. And she was like, wow, I, I just don't even know what to say. They were just in utter shock. And that is exactly why representation matter. We, they, they see themselves in me and they see potential in me and they see a path forward. They, these girls uh, hopefully will see themselves in leadership positions one day. We, um, and that's what I encourage um, people to do is to build that pipeline, bring them in. And that's why we intentionally seek out uh, interns from all different backgrounds so that they get that exposure in government. And the other reason why, uh, when I was talking about innovative solutions and why it's so important to get people to work on the issue or who know and understand the issues is so that they can work on the issues. For instance, I have a hate crimes bill right now because not only because we saw a rise in anti-hate and violence, but we saw a, a rise in hate crimes overall against the LGBTQ community, against community of color, against uh, people with disabilities. And I filed this bill so that we can hold perpetrators accountable, so that we can make sure that 
people know that we understand the issue and that we're not going to be silenced any longer and that we would not tolerate hate and violence any longer. And that's the power of representation. And I, I truly hope that we will um, build on that political power over time. Thank you very much. Um, Attorney Lee, Paul, um, not to out how old you are, but you've been living in Boston for a very long time. And have you seen improvement in representation of voices of power? Um, have you seen improvement? Um, and what have they been in your own eyes in you living in Boston? Um, that's a great question. Uh, when I was growing up in Chinatown, uh, in, this, in Boston, and this was in the 1950s, we, you know, it was an immigrant community. The, the general feeling was that we had to keep our heads down, mind our own business, not, not stand out. And so we, we, that, that's how we lived. And that, that's how uh, our parents lived. And that's how they brought us up. Um, and when, whenever there were issues that were affecting Chinatown, there were very few uh, people who were willing to, to stand up and, and advocate. Um, you, you really just had the, uh, the elders and the merchants association, but they weren't really fully representative. Um, fast forward now, 50 years later, uh, we have a number of community-based organizations populated by activists. Uh, we have a lot of young folks who have been coming back into uh, the Chinatown community and the other ethnic enclaves, and they're really building community power. Um, you know, an example of this is up in Lowell, where I guess now 28% of the population in Lowell is Asian American. And it started with a small group of uh, Cambodian refugees uh, over a span of 20 or 30 years. They, they, they came together. They, they supported each other. You know, the, their organization is called the Mutual Assistance Association. Um, and now they're in a situation where uh, they have two uh, Cambodian American representatives in, in the House who are colleagues of Representative Nguyen. They have three city councilors and they have the mayor. Uh, they, they have a lot of power in that city now, whereas 30 years ago, they were they, they just they came in as immigrants and really uh, you know, had nobody advocating for them. So I think we're, we're kind of seeing that uh, with a lot of uh, Asian um, communities now. And it really is this power of representation. When you see that there are people in a position that Representative Nguyen, Nguyen is to, to advocate for you, to speak up for you, to stand up for you, to be role models for your kids, I mean, that gives you hope. That gives you hope that, you know, you really may, maybe you can achieve a sense of belonging in this country so that we won't feel like perpetual foreigners um, again and again and again. Uh, you know, the, 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 the national press, local press, they, they tend to, 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 to fall back on the stereotypes of the model minority myth and, you know, how we're, you know, we work hard and we mind our own business and we won't, we you know, really won't speak up for ourselves. The perpetual foreigner, if anything happens uh, that you know, with the Chinese government that's adverse, all of a sudden, uh, all, all Asians are viewed as the enemy. You know, um, look what Russia is doing. It, the, the, the reaction to Russian Americans has been much, much more limited. And that, that's, you know, that this is something that we've always lived with and the way we overcome it is through representation to have strong voices like Representative Nguyen in, in politics and uh, Professor Nash and Professor Wu in the, in the legal and education field. And, and Paul, um, in, the, in your own professional legal field, what improvements have you seen in terms of representation in the legal field? Um, there, there has been... Uh, quite a bit of improvement. When I went to law school uh, in the 1970s, uh, there were three Asians in my class of 150. Uh, in the whole school of 500, there were 10. Now, I think it's more like 15, 20% or even more. And that means more Asian American lawyers are, are entering the profession. 
which means more of them are able to do follow the kind of uh, path that uh, Representative Nguyen uh, followed by going into public service. Um, and, you know, but others have, have moved into the corporate arena and have become decision makers and, and, you know, and they've, they've been able to get into the, in, into the corporate boardrooms. Um, I, I went into a law firm at a time when there were very few Asians on the East Coast who, who were at law firms. I was the first one at my law firm in New York, first one in my law firm in Boston. And for many years, there were less than a handful of us, um, at, at, at each law firm. And in the 19, mid 1980s, half a dozen of us got together and said, well, let's form an Asian American Lawyers Association of Massachusetts. Um, how many Asian lawyers do we think there are in this town? 15 or 20? And we ended up going through a list of names and we came up with a mailing list of about 30. This is the mid 1980s. And we, we formed the association. A lot of it was really just to support each other because each of us in our own uh, you know, work environment, we felt like we were the only one. We felt like you know, we were in a, on an island. But as we met uh, our colleagues at other law firms, we realized that we were all experiencing the same thing and that we could uh, you know, mentor each other and be uh, of mutual support. And now, uh, you know, ALAM, as we call it, the Asian American Lawyers Association of Massachusetts, has about 500 members, and we we, and we have an annual banquet that's attended by three or 400 people. So, and and you know, we have judges, we have state representatives, we have a mayor now. Mayor Mayor Wu is a graduate of Harvard Law School, and she was actually a scholarship recipient uh, from ALAM when she was in law school, and she was a uh, she was she was very very good about you know meeting with us consulting with us and seeking our help as she was moving up the ranks from being an intern to a uh, city councilor and now mayor so you know we can all work together to to push each other forward professor nash uh, what have you seen and i'm sure it's not always improvements what what do you think personally is the slow pace of the improvement? Um, so I, I would love to get your take on it. Well, I can tell you, I mean, uh, Paul and I have known each other for decades. And, you know, the problem was there were so few of us entering the profession back in the 80s. Uh, when I started teaching in 1986 at a law school in New York, um, the first day I went there to pick up my books, I told the guard, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a new professor. I'm picking up my books. And he said, oh, wait a minute. And he called upstairs and uh, found out, you know, who's this guy with a leather jacket and his hair slicked back? Uh, you know, doesn't look like a law professor. There's no tweed with the patches on his elbows. Uh, and yes, I was a law professor. And, you know, I went up there and I continued teaching and I've been teaching for many years now. But the point is, I didn't look like what they expected. That's why when you look and see a judge or a representative or a partner in a law firm, like uh, my three co-panelists here, or even look at the mayor, she doesn't look like the typical way you would expect the mayor of Boston after having seen Marty Walsh, all these other people. Uh, but she is the mayor. She's doing a great job. And I personally have seen, for example, with Japanese American redress that I was very involved in starting in the 70s through the successes in 1988 and continuing with the Japanese Latin American redress today, um, we needed some help. Uh, you remember I discussed the Yikwo versus Hopkins. The Chinese laundry owners in the 1800s had to hire white lawyers. There were no Asian American lawyers. They had no representatives. They had nobody. They had to hire these people as their advocates. But when we did the redress movement, we had Asian Americans who had been elected from Hawaii. There had been a very strong labor movement that sided with some Japanese Americans who had fought during World War II. They came back. We had people like Senator Daniel Inouye and others who became elected representatives and then finally senators. So that became our center when we wanted to go to Congress to find out how to file the bill for Japanese American redress. And we had Norman Mineta, we had Robert Matsu, we had people who were elected from the mainland. And that's how I learned how to do lobbying. I was one of the first paid lobbyists of Asian American ancestry. And I was working for the Washington Coalition on Redress, representing 
people up in Washington State who wanted to have a voice there. And I didn't know anything. I had to learn as I was going. And I, in turn, have taught a lot of people. I helped to found the Asian American Action Fund, which is a group that has helped a lot of people become candidates. I became a journalist and helped a lot of people of all political backgrounds, Republicans, Democrats, everyone. I want Asian Americans to get to that table. And then we can talk about our policy differences. In fact, one of my heroes is Shirley Chisholm, one of the first black women who was elected. And she said, if nobody's going to give you a seat, you bring a card table, you bring a, a card, a, a folding chair to the table. And I always thought that was excellent. And I like to bring Representative Patsy Mink into the room also. She's somebody we need to study who was a representative from Hawaii who didn't just fight for Asian Americans. She was very active on Title IX. In fact, this bill that helped a lot of our Asian American women and all women to become active in sports, that's because of her advocacy. So again, getting back to my analogy from before, where when you push and vindicate your rights, it doesn't help you and your family, people who look like you, it helps everybody. So um, uh, I'll stop there. I, I've got more stories, but let's, <laughs> let's continue. Thank you. Representative uh, Wynn, how can we as individuals whether we're Asians or not, how can we all who are the participants of uh, this training and this program, how can we as individuals have power and voice for the Asian American community? Great question. And to follow up on Professor Nash, Nash's point uh, about bringing a folding chair to the table, like the way we do that is to elect more <laughs> API people into office, right? Uh, and I think that that's just so important. And actually, I was looking through the list of participants, I see a, a lot of my supporters on there as well. That's exactly what we need to be doing is that we need to support each other, not only to get us into, you know, most people pay attention to Congress and Senate, but it's all levels of government, from the local level to state level to the federal level, all levels so that our voices can be heard. And it's really exciting to see uh, the rise of uh, Mayor Wu, as we saw, or Mayor Chow in Lowell and other AAPI electeds, like in the um, legislature right now, the uh, House Asian Caucus, we are the largest caucus uh, in terms of people of color, uh, which is exciting. But many of us are leaving as well. Uh, and so how do we get people into office and support them so they would stay there? That's key as well. Um, and thirdly, we need to, as I mentioned earlier, support interns. Uh, there are many, unfortunately, because of restrictions, we can't pay interns. What does that mean? How many people are we actually leaving out? People who can't afford free internships. How do we work together as a community to provide paid internships so that people, I know for myself, when I was growing up as a working class person at the first in my family to really attend a university, I could not have afforded any of these unpaid internships, right? And so how do we be intentional about that? And how do we um, be there for one another? If you can't donate, door knock. If you can't door knock, make phone calls. If you can't make phone calls, help translate materials. There are just so many different ways to help uh, candidates, to get them engaged, get them elected, so that they can then not only represent the Asian um, American community, but also all communities of color, immigrant communities, et cetera. And so I, I think that there is great momentum that we need to continue to build on, and we need to build on that uh, that gra uh, gra um, grassroots support of just everyone being out there committed to getting people in. And I agree with you, Professor Nash, that, you know, we can figure out the politics later, but right now we need to make it normal for people to see someone like me and say, yes, of course, she is a representative. She looks like a representative rather than them looking at me and saying, well, I envisioned a, you know, six, two white guy and here you are trying to door knock and get my vote. So how do we normalize that process? by increasing our numbers. And that's what we need to be intentional about doing. I, I'd like to jump in and and, yes, uh, and second what the, what Representative Nguyen it's, it's said. Um, but the Asian Community Fund, what we're trying to do is to unite the, the entire Asian community, all of the different ethnicities. And we're trying to build the power and, and strength of the Asian American community. 
we did a webinar last December, and you, you can find it on our website, tbf.org slash ACF. It, it, the recording is available. And the whole point of that, that webinar was that there has been a tremendous rise in the population of Asian Americans in Massachusetts and greater Boston and Massachusetts. There are a lot of towns now that have more than 15% Asian Americans as their residents. Uh, you know, and a number of the big ones we all know about Quincy, Malden, Lexington, Lowell, um, you know, they're, they're, they're either at 30% or more. The so 30% of the population of the city or town is Asian American. Then you have to ask the question, okay, do we have representation on the town councils, the city councils, the school committees? And for the parents who are worried about their kids being bullied in school, you know, and, and whether the school administration is uh, responding uh, with enough sensitivity and appropriately, um, you know, and we've had a number of cases in greater Boston of uh, hazing on sports teams uh, directed toward uh, students of color, you know, and so the message we were giving to the uh, parents was, if you want to be sure to hold the school administration, the city admin town administration accountable, you have to be in elected office. And so, you know, I'm pleased that in Lexington, where the population is over 30% Asian, and the uh, school population in the public schools is 42% Asian, two out of the five members of the school committee are Asian American, one of whom is a former chair of, of the school committee. And what they've been able to do is advocate for uh, teaching Asian American history in the school oh, curriculum, um, because a lot of the, you know, af after, you know, in, after the Atlanta spa shootings and the increase in anti-Asian hate, a lot of students went home and told their parents that, you know, I I'm being bullied, I'm being disrespected, there's microaggressions all the time against me by my classmates because they don't know who I am, they don't understand my history, and plus, if I'm just sitting there studying Western history all the time, I'm, I don't even feel confidence and, you know, and, and pride in, in my own background. So the parents, actually, a lot of suburban parents are becoming very much um, active now, civically and politically. And so, uh, you know, when, when, when Representative Nguyen talks about door knocking and getting active, there are a lot, there's a lot of grassroots activity. I think the next step is to find, uh, you know, more of, of those folks who are willing to actually, you know, put themselves out there and run for office and be part of government. Thank you. I actually have a lot more prepared questions, but we have a very good question um, asked by the participants. So I'm going to jump right into that. Do you ever struggle between wanting to share the parts of you that feel very rooted in your Asian background? and also wanting to demonstrate that there's no difference between you uh, and your average white person. Uh, Professor Nash. Well, I, I am the average white person, at least half of me. Uh, but you know, it, it's a false dichotomy. It, it's a false dichotomy. I am a whole person. I am wholly American. I speak many languages and I work down in Brazil with Asian Brazilians. Uh, I go down there and work with people from Amazonia. I don't define myself in any one way. I mean, Walt Whitman said, I contain multitudes, and that's the way I see myself. I happen to be Asian American, but I am not fighting for Asian American rights. I'm fighting for human rights. I want everyone to have the same rights and privileges that I have. And so when I take my class to Annapolis, Maryland, to advocate on behalf of marriage equality, one of my students said, um, excuse me, this class is about Asian Americans. Why are we helping gay people? And I said, well, first of all, there are Asian American gay people. And second of all, if I don't fight for the rights of other people, then why would they come and protect my rights? We have to defend the rights of all people. So I think we have to get out of this mindset that an Asian American is X, or these are the things, you know, I want to be able to look at Representative Wynn and say, yeah, she's a representative. Not, oh my God, she's the first, you know, we need to get beyond that. I remember when I started as a law professor, there were so few of us, we all knew each other. 
And now there's a giant listserv of Asian American law professors with hundreds of people on it. I don't know a lot of these people. And that's fabulous. When I first was a lawyer, I knew who Paul was, even though he was up in Boston. And, you know, now there are so many Asian American lawyers. You go to a NAPABA conference, uh, a National Asian Pacific American Bar Association. I wouldn't know most of the people. And I think that's great. I don't want them to agree with me. I don't want to know everyone. I want to see so many of us in positions of power that we don't have an Asian American position on anything, that we are just like everyone else doing our thing, pushing for what we want and what our constituents want and trying to do the best we can. But um, hoping to represent all Asian Americans, I, I think that's a fool's errand. Uh, Representative Wynn, have you had that struggle or that dichotomy of being proud of your heritage, but also wanting to blend in and that dichotomy of it? I think I understand that question very well myself. I understand that very well. I, I don't think that there is an urge uh, to blend in. I think that I agree with Professor Nash that it's about getting to a place where we don't need to blend in, that we're just one of them, right? And But as we're getting there, uh, I think that it's important for us to embrace it. As we were talking about representation uh, earlier, my background defines, makes me who I am. And I want to contribute my experiences, my history into whatever conversations we're currently having and show people how it would affect me and my family. So that struggle is something that I just continue to do because at the end of the day, uh, you can't separate yourself from who you are. And so, you know, so many, uh, you identify in so many uh, different ways. And I think it's important for us to think about intersectionality and how we can find commonality with other people and how we can collaborate with them to build on whatever progress for all. And that's what I continue to remind myself. I, I, as you were saying that, I, I really was struggling with going back to, especially my first election, when I had my opponent purposely othering me, right? And how I had to overcome it because I was running against a white man who has been in this office for eight years. So he tried to paint me as, well, she's not from here. Well, no, I grew up in the Merrimack Valley at five years old. And oh, uh, she is, uh, she's out of touch with what we want. There are all these hidden messages in there, right? And so I went out of my way to show that I was a part of the community. And what we need to show is that the community is beautiful and diverse. And we are part of that community. We're not just the Asian member of the community, right? We are the community. And we need to continue to build on that. I, I love this question because I feel like I could talk about it forever because it's something I struggle with so much every single day. So Paul, um, another great question that we had and please keep them coming because I'm nixing all my questions. Um, another great question was, um, you know, uh, Representative Wynn said that a community and uh, a collective collaborative community. Uh, another great question I had was, are there ways in some projects or collaborations where groups of different ethnicity and races can join together to voice mutual concern? Because I think historically, uh, different races and different ethnicities have been pinned against one another. Um, so I think this is a great question. That is a great question. Um, and I think actually one of the, uh, the uh, I guess, positive consequences, if you can say that, of the anti-Asian hate that that's happened and the Atlanta spa shootings is that it's made Asians of all ethnicities realize that we're being attacked because we're Asian, not because we're Vietnamese or Japanese or Chinese. And so that's broken down a lot of the barriers that have sort of historically existed in the Asian American community. Folks always worried about, well, if we come together at one ethnicity, Asian American, are we giving up our, our own identity as Chinese American? And I've never thought that. I mean, I, I, I know I'm Chinese, you know, and, and my parents, you know, taught me a lot of traditions that I want to hang on to. But I, I respect the, you know, my, my Vietnamese colleagues and all the traditions they have. It's just that there are a lot of issues where we can work together and, um, and we have to work together to, to be more powerful and to have a voice. And then in addition to that, 
you know, I talked about how a lot of the suburban Asians have gotten a lot more active civically and politically. The, the other thing that I'm hearing from them, which is, I think, really uh, you know, positive, is they're also saying we have to work with the other communities of color. You know, Asians alone are not going to be able to beat back this wave of racism and hatred, um, you know, that that has been, uh, you know, it's so terrible for the black community and the Latino community. We all have to come together. You know, that I think that the fear of white America is that, you know, we're going to become a so-called majority minority country, um, you know, where people of color outnumber the white folks. And this is the battle that's going on. But, you know, among the communities of color, if we don't work together, we're not the majority. We have to work together to have the power and strength to overcome this deeply entrenched white uh, dominant culture that, that we're living in. I want to actually uplift something that Paul mentioned earlier and um, about the CARE Coalition working for inclusive education. As you notice, in other states, there are some states who they just want to add Asian American history. But here, with the work that Paul and other community members are doing to build uh, a more inclusive, uh, racially and culturally inclusive education at the K-12 level, it's for all communities of color to make sure we understand the accomplishments and the contributions of all communities. And that's what we need to continue to build on in terms of even recovering from the pandemic. This is an opportunity for communities of color, immigrant communities to work together to make sure that we're not left out of the conversation when it comes to resources, when it comes to funding, when it comes to all of these opportunities that we deserve as our various communities, we want to be take a part in that pie, right? And so how do we build on that? How do we continue that collaboration and make sure that we, we all know that we are in it together? And I love that coalition building that Paul and others are doing to, to really emphasize that partnership that uh, we need to, to, to make stronger. Professor Nash. Yeah, I just want yes. to uh, am amplify uh, what my co-panelists are saying. Um, I have an exercise I use in my class that any of you can use in your classrooms or community groups. Uh, one student said, this is the worst anti-Asian violence ever, you know, in looking at the spa shootings and other things. And I said, well, hold on a second. And I had them split into four teams and they went to the board and had 20 minutes to Google and do research. And they looked at the 18th, 19th, 20th and 21st centuries. And at the end of 20 minutes of research, they said, oh, my goodness, there has been anti-Asian violence throughout American history directed against us. And somebody said, yeah, we're, we have the worst violence against us. I said, hold on, go back to the board. <laughs> Six groups. We're going to look at women, LGBT people, Black, Latino, Indigenous, and Asian American groups. 20 minutes. And at the end of that simple exercise, we had six lists. And I took a picture of it. It was so amazing. And just showing that this history of violence is endemic. The sad reality is the things we're seeing in Houston, things we're seeing in uh, uh, Buffalo, all over, these are the sad realities and we have to confront them. And so what I have started doing as a teacher is to start making my students realize that we are swimming in an ocean of isms, and all of us are wet. I am racist, I am sexist, I am homophobic, and I'm working mightily to overcome that. And what I propose to my students is having a cultural competence toolkit. And what that means is you don't have to walk on eggshells, you don't have to worry you're gonna say something sexist or something. I look at my own writing from 30 years and I go and I go, boy, look at that misinformed person. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> but I have grown. I've gotten better. I don't make sexist and homophobic comments. But still, I said recently, brothers and sisters, and somebody said, excuse me, I am not on this binary scale. I consider myself uh, somebody, your relative. So could you please say brothers, sisters and relatives? And so here am I teaching cultural competence, being schooled on this. And instead of saying, ah, shut up, kid, I said, wow, that is, I, I thank you for helping me to get better. I'll put that in my cultural competence toolkit. And it's an iterative toolkit. And it's going to keep growing until I die. And I'm going to pass it on to my students. 
And if we have that as a paradigm, having a micro kindness every day instead of some type of a microaggression, doing things to help other people, doing things to build a world where we're trying to deal with all of the problems that we're each facing in the African-American, Latinx, LGBT, other communities. I think if we have that as a way of looking at the world, then we as Asian Americans can help to bring peace and justice to everyone in our country. So that is uh, so powerful. That is just so powerful, Professor Nash. Um, you know, it is a lifelong learning. And, you know, just when you think that you've mastered it, you, you know, you're, you're brought up short and, and, and you see that. But what thing I like about the lifelong learning is that it makes me want to connect with other people. Mm -hmm. And, it, and, it, and, 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 you know, it just, it just feels so much better to be not just in my world, but to really expanding the world to try to, to try to connect with as many different types of people as possible and learn from them. And is that the solution in confronting the isms to, to interact with as many people? Uh, Prof um, Representative Nguyen, I'll ask you that question. Yes, to interact with them, to work with them, and to learn to disagree with them. It, mm -hmm. for, and that's the beauty of this is that we may not all agree. And sometimes it's you, you get a situation where it's best to agree to disagree. And as someone who represents a very purple district, I think that that is the advantage that I have is that I hear people from across the spectrum telling me, what I should and should not be doing. And I'm learning from each and every one of them, even those that I don't agree with. And I think that that's how we come up with powerful solutions is that when you listen to all the different voices, um, for instance, I mentioned earlier with my hate crimes bill, when I first filed it, the bill that I have right now looks so different because I had people telling me, you got it wrong. You need to fix this. And that is key to us finding these innovative solutions, because guess what? I am not an expert and I don't think that my idea is the end all be all. It's an idea that we need to build on together. And, and that's why we need to think about intersectionality, about bringing people in, all, all people from all their uh, different backgrounds, and then work towards a solution that um, could benefit all people. So I want to be mindful of the time um, and leave uh, with this last question from, from our participant, uh, which I think is a poignant question. Um, I guess with all the precariousness of the communities of color space, especially um, currently now, how do you personally find the strength when tragedies like these happen? That's going to be our last question. Um, and uh, um, Tough question, <laughs> uh, Paul. Um, well, as Professor Nash has taught us this evening, um, you know, these, these incidents of violence, these attacks, they're not new. They've always been there. It's, a, it's gonna be a constant battle to overcome them. Um, but the way we do it is by speaking up, by uniting with uh, and working together and collaborating to, you know, to have, you know, we're, we're, we're stronger together than if we're gonna individually try to fight these things um, and be, being supportive of each other. Uh, you know, if you see somebody being, being harassed or attacked, find a way to support them, even if maybe you can't stop the incident because you know, the, the, the perpetrator doesn't wanna stop. Maybe you can pull the person aside and, you know, and, and, you know, and, and separate them and, and then support them afterwards. You know, we have, we have to basically support each other and love each other and want to, you know, want to be together because then we're, then I think as a group, as, you know, we're, we're, we're much stronger. I don't think there's any uh, better words to end in that note. Um, I want to thank you all to the panelists. I want to thank Margaret Wu, Professor Wu for um, heading this um, and spearheading this, our captain of this group, and to all, um, all of you who are here today, to the participants. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. We want to thank you, Judge thank you. Tom, yes, thank, for thank your thank great you, job Tom. moderating as well. Thank Thanks you, everyone, everyone, for attending. Have thank you. Evening.